So fundamentals. Um, I wrote this this section because uh, actually we should probably have done this before the other session, but you know, things get mixed up. I wanted to uh, go through some of the fundamental types in Amiga OS because it. it I don't know if familiar everybody is with uh, strongly typed programming languages. Uh, C is strongly typed. The, the, I'll just, just do a quick review of the theory. The theory of strongly typed programming languages says the compiler will catch your errors for you. That's the theory. Right? Basic gist of it. Now, uh, there are other languages like, um, say, Python or Rex, which are not strongly typed. They use a I guess I guess you could say they, they both use duck typing in that if, if it looks like a string then it'll treat it like a string if it looks like a number it'll treat it like a number but you can you could really get some interesting problems with that but on the other hand it's it's also very freeing so <laughs> but uh, C being strongly typed means if you get a warning saying um, uh, what's was what invalid conversion or type error or something, there's likely, it's trying to tell you that there's an error in your program. It's trying hard to. You can ignore it, you can typecast it away, you know, say everything's fine, but usually it means you did something wrong. <laughs> so, with that in mind, I want to review the basic types in Amiga OS, because over time, they have changed over various versions of the OS. So I start with the easy ones. At the very top, uint64, that's an unsigned integer 64 bits wide for storing very, very large numbers. Um, in C and C++, they have, e, they have equivalent types, uint64 underscore t. UN, that's the, if you're using the standard ISO C++ or ISO C, those are the types you'd use. If you're um, using Amiga OS only, you use UAN 64 over here. But they're the same, but the compiler will treat them as unique types. So uh, you can't convert from one to the other without a typecast, that's a general idea. Now, there's a 64 UN32. The UN32 is interesting because it's got several deprecated names like long, U long, long bits, C pointer, CPTR. Those are the old names from the uh, 3.x era that uh, we no longer want to encourage. <laughs> and then the equivalent C again, C++. Uh, long, U word is a 16-bit wide word. Also known as U word, word bits, U short, U count, RPTR. <laughs> it's got all these different names for the same thing. But we, nowadays, in Amiga 4.0 and higher, we just use one type instead of a whole bunch of types. Uh, int 16, same thing. Uint 8 used to be called U-byte or byte bits. Uh, in C, Uint 8 can be a char or unsigned char. In C++, it's always unsigned char. So it's... It gets uh, it gets tricky. You have to know your you have to know your um, ISO C standard pretty well to get catch the subtleties there. Int eight byte or sign char center. String pointer S T R P T R. That's an old type from the old days. Um, it's also known as a char star. Good old pointers. That's how you store your your uh, eight bit strings. Then we get into some weirdness, which uh, I'll just sort of hand wave over. Um, <laughs> there's the const keyword was added in, I don't know, C99, C90, sorry, I think it was. I'm trying to remember what standard it was added in, but uh, const means constant. And uh, depending where you put that word, it means different things. <laughs> So we've, we've taken the uh, liberty of making equivalents in Amiga OS. So a const space string pointer means that. 
Planck's underscore string pointer means that. They are different. <laughs> they are different. If you want to really understand why they're different, uh, Wikipedia or something might be better. <laughs> Just know that const string pointer is the one you normally should use for 90% of the time, maybe, 99% of the time. That's a constant string pointer. And it means if I go <coughs> const string pointer c equals hello, it's hello forever. It's hello. <laughs> it's a string. Can't change it. Um, then there's a pointer. A pointer means any pointer, amiga pointer, a pointer. I mean, it's a pointer to something. Also known as a void pointer in C. How is that different than just pointer? It's a pointer to nothing. It means, it actually, it's a pointer to a type that's not defined. <laughs> so it's yeah, like, it's a pointer, but to something, right? And what you can do is you can get implicit conversions from void star to other pointer types without a compiler warning. That's what happens there. So um, it's a little bit subtle, <laughs> I admit. I admit. When, I'm kind of, once you get used to it, it's not so bad, but it's subtle. So you'll see in the autodocs there are all of these types on the left hand side being used. Uh, then there's const combinations again. There's various combinations. Don't really have to understand them yet, but uh, they may bite you at some point. <laughs> then we get back to some normal stuff again. This is more normal. We got float 32, which is a 32-bit wide floating point value. Yes, question? Right above float 32, you've got const and then const underscore mm -hmm. aptr. Yeah, lovely. Is that it's not const, const, aptr, it's const or const. No, it's a const space. Space. Okay. Space, yeah, the, the wiki is wrapping it. Okay, what is what I need to know. What is the reason to point to that? Uh, it's very I, rarely used. I mean, I can't, I can't cast that as something else. Anymore. It's very, very rarely used. It's, it's, I don't think it ever used, really. Yeah, I don't see what you mean for. Yeah, it's kind of pointless. Yeah. But it's there, so <laughs> so I might take it off. Like a really, like a might draw an array of function pointers. Or yeah, it's very odd. I don't know what the heck you use it for. Yeah, very odd. I don't think it's ever used. I've never seen it in any code in the in a while. I've, I've seen never seen this construct ever. Cons, void star constant. I've never seen it. Um, doesn't mean it's not out there. <laughs> thirty-two bit float is just a thirty-two bit wide. 64-bit float is what normal CPUs use these days. 64-bit, and the hardware is generally tuned to it. Um, i trying to remember in the 68,000. 60 bits. What's the max? I don't think float 32 had any hardware support. I'm trying to remember what had. I don't think it had hardware support. No. No. So, uh, there was some special Motorola libraries you could use to do Flip32. Um, in the PIC world, I use Flip32 a lot. <laughs> That's embedded processing. So yes. Dave, uh, you said that the Flip64 is pretty much standard for today's processors. For today's processors. You're using floating point math. Yes. Now, I asked the question one, I think on Amigans. You see a lot of code that has just int, int, integer, but it's not 32 or 64, so if you use that term in your code, what word length is used? Ah, well, the, the question was, uh, if you use int, what word length is used, right? It's minimum 16 bits. That is it. Is that what? Well, that's uh, what's dictated. That's by dictated by the ISOC right. standard. But when, if you use int in your code on Amiga OS, what do you On mean? Amiga OS, it means yeah. signed 32-bit. But that's only because the compiler says so. Right. See, I could, I could make a compile of GCC that makes int equal to oh, of unsigned 16-bit value. Yeah, I just, uh, on Amiga, it, it, you 
Yeah. I'm allowed to. Yeah. 32 of it's signed. Yeah. Although Amiga keep, means 32 is signed. I do keep seeing old code samples, and they refer to things like ints and longs and floats. Yeah. And when you want to use that code but modernize it, what is it that they were meaning back in the day? Ah, uh, see, that's the trouble with those values. See, that's Excellent. that's why that's why C and C plus plus now use these. <laughs> They, they didn't have it back in 89, right? They had to use int, or uint. And what did it mean? Depended on your compiler. Totally dependent on the compiler. It had a minimum It had a minimum width and a minimum meaning, but that was it. You could make it bigger. Like, int could be 64. Yeah, generally, I think the standard, yeah. the pseudo standard that emerged was the, mm -hmm. the bus width of whatever processor you were using. No, <laughs> not my experience. <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, there, there is there's ISO ISO C standard, and it, it was written the way it was written, and then people just made up their own standards on top of that. Okay. Yeah, but ISO C was always clear from the start. It was never undefined. It was never the bus bus width of the computer or any other de facto standard. There's lots of Lots of theories, but <laughs> I go by the ISO C standard because <laughs> yeah, it's written it and it's internationally recognized. So it's pretty strong. Pretty strong. I mean, people can still ignore it, of course. But now, yeah, you're right. Uh, like Paul said, what what is a long, right? What is a double long or long long? Or, right. Right. Now these all have minimum definitions in ISO C, but generally I don't use them so much. Uh, the real world. I use the new, newer. I should say new because they're not new. <laughs> they're good, 15 years old. These guys here. <laughs> so, but when you're referring to deprecated types, you're really talking about deprecated types in the larger computer no. world. When I say deprecated, I mean Amiga OS deprecated. Oh, well, we don't want to use these anymore. Should we add int to those? That we don't no, to int things? is a standard ISO type. It's not Amiga. Oh, in the yes. Amiga world, there wasn't the definition. For int? Correct, yeah. Correct. It's ISO C. Previously known as ANSI C. <laughs> but, I mean, if you looked at an old 68K oh, Amiga program and you typed you had int, yeah. what size was it? Well, it depends on your compiler. Depends on the Again, compiler. in SAS C, there was a command line option that you can <laughs> set it to either 32-bit <laughs> or 16-bit. Okay. Yeah, you can, you can, the compiler gets to choose. Okay. Yeah. And the vendor gets to choose. Right. Right. The vendor can do anything they wish. <laughs> you know, I just, I guess what I'm wondering is, when you look at your RKM, they use int, they were meaning something. Well, in the RKRM, they shouldn't have used int. They had their own types, but I, I think what happened was the programmers were ahead of the standards in, in Commodore or something, right? And they were okay. typing up example code and they were using int and no one seemed to care. <laughs> just <kept> going. <laughs> And so they kind of get ahead. You're, you're messing around with integer numbers. Or let's take an old program. Old program, yeah. You have like in some of the examples for the OS4 examples that came from the latest SDK. And in there they use int. And that would be 32 bit. 32 bit signed as Let's say yeah. you only need an 8 bit number to do what you are doing. Yeah. Is there any advantage to using an 8-bit number instead of a 32-bit? Is there any advantage? Uh, it depends on the CPU architecture, actually. Yeah. It, and it can actually be worse or it can be better. A, as a variable, you're going to assign a variable. Yeah. Should you use integer, which would take it to 32 bits, well, or if you on, use... On a power PC, yeah, you should use the bigger one. On the, yeah, it depends on the CPU, which one you should choose. And, since uh, we're PowerPC based now, 32-bit is the minimum you should choose. So yeah. if you use an 8, it still goes out to 32? If you use an 8, it's going to do some fancy dancing to get it up to 32 and do it anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> so 32 gets used. One yeah, one. well, it's not that simple, but... Uh, you're wasting cycles. You're wasting cycles, yes. Okay. yes. Shifters um, again. So we, we could have LD show you how that works. <laughs> since, since he, he, he designs the chips. So. <laughs> so if you're using your program 
Yes. Back there. CPU crunching. Uh, int or int 32. Yeah. You want to stick with 32 bit when you're on power. Okay, so you're, okay. Let's say using a serial board or something where you're not going through the CPU, then you can get yes. away with Yes. So or, you're right. If you're going over a wire, yeah. say Ethernet, serial, parallel, something, you want to use their native size that they like for their hardware, right? Yeah. yeah. If you want optimum speed and optimum code. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting dance trade-offs. Um, in the older older days it made a lot of difference, but nowadays not so much. Uh, when I'm doing a embedded work, it makes a large amount of difference which one I choose. Because I'm working on one pick that prefers 16-bit. If you do anything else, it's going to take a ton of cycles to do whatever you're asking. And that you can't afford, because you only have like 10 nips. So, uh, <laughs> you don't fool around, right? You use their native size. So, but on Amiga OS, since it's PowerPC at the moment, 32 bits of best. <laughs> so, so that raises a good question about future. Um, assuming at some point we're going to have a 64-bit system, is this something that really do we care, bit or, or do we let? Uh, generally, you shouldn't care. Because I'm assuming on a 64-bit system, the 64-bit mm -hmm. is. Uh, it's not that simple. Uh, a 64-bit, you think, well, a 64-bit int is the perfect one. Well, there's a lot of compatibility tricks in most CPUs. Because look at the code base, right? Look at the executable base. Everything's 32 still, generally speaking. It'll be many years until everything's 64-bit. So uh, the chips accommodate for that. They're the simplest terms they accommodate for it. So, so from a if getting started, mm -hmm. if I need an integer, hit 32, yep. move on. 32 is the best, just pick 32 all the time. Even uh, for loop counters, I'm always using 32 bit because I know they're quicker. So, so one other <laughs> note for uh, people using CodeBench if you type int it, it, in the default uh, color highlighter, it's a dark blue. But if you type int 32, it's a light blue. So when I'm always going through my code, I always try to make all the variables light blue. Cause oh, there's, the there's a tip, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know it does It does light blue for Amigo S types. It. I guess. I don't know. The, uh, maybe that's the rule. I don't know what the rule is. I just noticed that light blue is better than well, well, the Well, uh, we'll have to ask Simon what he did there. It's in the rich editor gadget. Oh, it's the rich it's editor gadget file. profile? Or? Yeah. But you can change it. The default one is okay. dark blue. Float would be dark blue, but float 32 is light blue. Okay, because so float is a native ISO. So, yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's not a bad idea to, to recommend using red for, uh, for Amiga types that aren't uh, Amiga types. Yeah, yeah you, could, you could argue for that. But that's Amiga specific code again. And it depends what your target is. <laughs> so there's your double int char again, text null. Oh, null's interesting. Yeah. <sighs> um, <laughs> I could probably go on for like an hour about no. Uh, it's a lot more complex than you imagine. So we have a type in Amiga OS called no, and you'll see it used a lot in our code. It really means a zero L, L meaning long and signed, long, long meaning 32 bit. <laughs> Because of the compiler again, but it's signed, which is interesting. It's not unsigned. <laughs> it's, it's subtle. Um, in C++, it doesn't mean that at all. It means a void star zero long. <laughs> and you're like, what? <laughs> yeah. Well, C++ is more strongly typed than C. It won't let you get away with the implicit type conversions. So they had to use this type to get rid of the compiler warnings in the simplest terms. I don't want to get into all the nitty gritty details. Now, unfortunately, both of these techniques break when you go to 64-bit pointers. So they're both bad. <laughs> and you, when you move to 64-bit C++, you need to use a zero, and only a zero, right? <laughs> now, that, that requires a scrubbing of code and blah, 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 but uh, I don't want to uh, 
scare you now. You don't worry about 64-bit right now. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah I'll, that's, we'll leave it at that for now. If, if you want to know more about no, um, I have a couple articles you could read. I think it was Much Ado About No, one of them. I, <laughs> that's a very good article about why, why it's so complicated. It, uh, it goes all the way back to uh, the beginning of C where they didn't define a nil. Uh, for example, in Python, there's a nil. It's a type. It means nothing, basically. It's a nil. But in C, there was never a nil. There's no definition of nothing. So various vendors picked their own definition of nothing, and now we're in this bit of a mess. Now, I can't remember if C++ added nil or not to the recent uh, 2011 standard. I think they actually did add a nil, a true nil type. So uh, we might see that change in the future, maybe years. Because right? everyone's used to null, zero, zero L, or whatever the platform gives you that day for null. <laughs> it's quite a mess. Anyway. <clears throat> Speaking of messes. No, it doesn't have anything to do with a null string. Null string meaning two quotes, is that what you're referring to? That's an empty string, null string. That, that's, that's defined as a const tarsar type. That actually has a definition of the standard, and it was for a very long time. So there's no problem with that one. That one has a solid definition. Uh, these three at the bottom, that's uh, BCPL leftovers. <sighs> DOS. <laughs> you know about Amiga DOS history, I assume? It, it was kind of, forget. I got it in my book upstairs, but you can read the precise story. But basically, at the last minute, they needed a DOS, and they grabbed this BCPL and they shoehorned it in there. And now we got these strange types: B pointer, B string, and zero. Zero is kind of newish, but uh, I, I'm not sure if that's an Amiga OS three or not. But basically, a B pointer is a special type of pointer only used by DOS. And uh, we're trying to hide it as much as possible. But it actually resolves down to an int32t. If you wanted to uh, find out what a real type was underneath the covers. And then we had a zero because you can't compare a B pointer to null. They are different types. <laughs> you have to actually compare a B pointer to a zero, which is a, a zero with a B pointer type list, in order to get proper uh, compiler warnings working. It's just the, the way of the beast. So, so it could, you could get some strange code. I noticed uh, Paul's code wasn't uh, totally up to date in that area, so I, I went and fixed it up a bit. Uh, you had the wrong type compared to your B pointers. That's a subtle problem, very subtle, minor. <laughs> I'm, I'm a nitpicker, so I haven't fixed them up. <laughs> so basically, the message would be, try to use the types on the far left as much as possible to avoid all sorts of problems. <laughs> now, if you're working in ISO C, you probably want to use these types more often, right, to try to keep it portable as possible. It's going to be a little bit of about. In books, you'll see these ones. Or you'll see the more primitive uh, uh, int, long, short, which don't really have as, as a tight meaning. So it might be useful for this wiki to put desirable over the far left column. Put, put desirable over there, under type it. Try to use this type versus, well, the deprecated types, obviously, we try to stay away. but. I mean, most of our header files still have deprecated types in them. It takes a long time to get rid of them because it's kind of boring to go and fix all the code. <laughs> Even though we should. You know. So I thought I'd uh, just go through the types and try to, try to document them a little better. I, sh I wanted to add a description of what they're for over there, but I never got around to them. Sorry. <laughs> Try to get to that soon. Is there a, a purpose? Resource 
that we can find all that for us newbies? That's it. <laughs> That's your resource. <laughs> Sorry. Is there a resource? Well, this is the only resource for the four I'm aware of. For that column you didn't have yet. Yeah, yeah. Okay. There's no other resource. Now, of course, if you just pick up the standard, you can look up what the meaning of that is. It goes from zero to some ridiculously huge number. Okay. And, <laughs> and all that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Types, and the, like I said at the beginning, the whole purpose of all this type nonsense is to try and catch errors when you're compiling. That's the whole purpose. It's not to make life miserable. It's to try and catch errors early. And then the other dual purpose is try to tune it for the hardware that you're using as well. But that's becoming less meaningful as the CPUs get so powerful that you don't care about wasting cycles so much anymore, even though you should. <laughs> then I wanted to get into, uh, oh, any more questions on types before I move on? Because uh, I don't want to leave you in the dark. It's really boring, I know. But want to mention it. We can talk about types a long time. <laughs> Now, linking, oh, linking, love linking. Um, so some of you, I'm trying to remember the survey results, some of you weren't so familiar with compilers and such. So how many people know what linker, what a linker does? Only three? Oh, God. <laughs> um, okay, I'll just, I'll just do a quickie. Okay, when you compile a .c, it goes into a .o, right? .c produces a .o file. Take a bunch of .o files, you link them together, make an .exe in Windows, or just a binary in Amigo S, an executable, if you will. <laughs> That's what a linker does. Takes all those, mixes them together, out it comes. Now, um, of course, you, you don't want to, there's kind of two forms of, of linking. Static linking and dynamic linking. And I was trying to explain here through the use of an example what the difference is between a static link and a dynamic link. A static link is done at compile time. A dynamic link is done at run time. So basically, say, say you had a, you're gonna crash. <laughs> say you're gonna crash. Or you, say you had a bug. Uh, your bug should show up when you link it, when you're static linking, or it will show up and run when you run it, if you're using dynamic linking. So you get a visit from the guru, the Grim Reaper, if you have a dynamic linking issue. Can be a little late. So I did a little hello world there. This hello world is created using static linking. And I used the command line, because I didn't know what to do in code pitches. <laughs> Sorry. I'm so used to command line. So here's the command line. You can see I used clib2. That's on purpose, right? clib2. I'm using clib2 because I want to show you it's a static library. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to link in everything you need into that binary. And then I'm going to produce hello, and then there's some extra stuff here I threw on. And I did a strip so that I strip out any stuff that shouldn't be there. And I found out my executable, just to say hello world, was 34,964 bytes long. And all it does is print hello world. And you're like, what? <laughs> Why is it so big? Well, I use static linking. <laughs> so every, almost everything it needs is in that executable. The gist of it. <laughs> and it's going to pull in stuff you don't want. It's got, uh, it probably, I can't remember, it probably has floating point conversion in there. It probably has a uh, string conversion in there. It's got integer conversion. It's got all sorts of code. It's got uh, locale information in there. It's all linked in. Oh, everything's in there. All the stuff you didn't want. All you wanted to print was hello world. <laughs> Would a statically linked program be more future proof than dynamic? Uh, would it be more future proof? Actually, yeah, it can be. It can be. Uh, you're, you're, you're more immune to uh, dynamic library updates. And uh, 
I've used that in the past on other systems where the customer, you don't know what version of the shared library is on there. So you static link the sucker and yours, <laughs> give it to them and you know what they're running now, right? They don't have some weird library getting sucked in, crashing them, you know? It can be used as a protection, but of course your, my executable was several megs in size, right? <laughs> but I've used it to, to protect customers from themselves, basically. <laughs> Instead of logging into their machine, fixing all their libraries, here you go. Now I know it works. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> the OS shouldn't be uh, libraries uh, be steady enough or kept upgraded. Amigo OS doesn't have as much churn as not as much uh, backward compatibility breaking. Yeah. So I, I don't have as many problems yeah. as you know. There's not. There's not a. Hundred thousand programmers coding on it at the moment. <laughs> so, you, so you don't have that churning issue, constant churning. Yeah. Then I have a little explanation of what's going on there. I produce a linker map file, at hello.map. This little bit here can be very interesting uh, reading if you want to get into the internals of what's going on. Sorry? The map file is an output file. It's, and the map file is an output file. It shows you a linker map of all the symbols in your code that you don't know are there. It's all this stuff hidden, right? That's pulling in and it's linking all this stuff. It's interesting reading if, uh, if you're into that. I, I use linker maps uh, generally to diagnose strange behavior. Like, you're, what? like you can't understand why it's not running. Check your linker map. Maybe it's pulling in something you don't know, and that it's not your fault. It's the compiler pulling something in. You know, you never know. Especially if you do multi-platform, it's essential to have a map to know what's going on. I find anyway. <laughs> now, producing dynamic linking, I use newlib. See, you got newlib in there. The same program is 5,488 bytes. Much, much smaller. Still not super small, but it's much smaller. It's got a lot of overhead in there still from the uh, standard C library start up and shut down and a few other things that you generally don't need, but it's included as a convenience. Now you can get this all the way down to like 400 bytes if you just use raw DOS function calls. <laughs> if you're into that, but then you're bypassing the C library, you're bypassing the startup code, you're just hammering bytes. <laughs> and you lose you lose all the convenience then. But boy, is it small and tight. So, and if you want to go smaller, you just do assembly. <laughs> it's the next step down. You might save a few more bytes then. But, uh, I was trying to show you uh, here. Oh, I got a little note about the dash n, which you can check out later. It's, it's just a little problem with their current compiler. It aligns to a page size, which can make the binaries extra big. And it doesn't hurt anything except eat a little bit more disk. Um, <laughs> what else did I say here? Uh, yeah, I wanted to kind of make the point that uh, the binary looks small. But it, it may actually be writing the same amount of code in the end. Like it's following a path through the code. It may actually just be the same speed. It just looks smaller. <laughs> so you know you can't you can't equivalent. Uh, you can't say a smaller binary is faster. You can't just say oh it's faster. It loads faster. Sure, but it doesn't mean it's faster. So I just want to make sure that you understand. It doesn't mean it's better per se. <laughs> it can be though. It can, but um, my experience, depending on the platform, um, like if I, if I take this hello world and I do a static link Java program, probably like 10 megabytes. <laughs> Java's huge. <laughs> Press hello world. <laughs> it's got all these layers, right? <laughs> you, you swing a little bit there. Yeah, you swing like a GUI. Oh, it's a gigabyte, but 
and you know, all I did was hello. <laughs> That's a static link. Dynamic, it looks just fine. It's like, you know, okay. <laughs> it, still, it still will run through the same amount of code, though. It just looks bigger. <laughs> Um, I also want to, to make sure that you know uh, mixing static libraries and shared libraries can be dangerous for your health. So uh, <laughs> it can be, it can be. It's not always, but uh, um, you can get into some subtle problems. Don't 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 just assume you can mix and match libraries any which way you feel like. Like if I grab a shared library from Aminet, stick it in my program, and just link it up. It might not just work. There, there might be some more going on under the covers there. So don't, don't just assume you can mix and match everything. I know it'd be nice if you could, but uh, it's not the, the way it works. <laughs> so I just wanted to make sure that, that you understand uh, it's not as straightforward as it seems, unfortunately. <laughs> and it's, it's a common trap I find with, uh, with the junior programmers as they kind of assume a lot of things should just work. They don't think deep enough, so I want to mention that. <laughs> oh, any questions on static dynamic linking before I uh, get going again? So, um, the shared object and or MegaOS shared libraries still dynamic? Oh, the shared objects? Yeah. Uh, well, when I'm talking um, static dynamic linking here, it's uh, kind of ISO C ish, but. Then we have, that's why the next section is about Amiga shared libraries. Oh, <laughs> kind of caught me, but. Shared libraries and that is dynamic. Now, a shared yeah. library is a dynamic library. It's dynamically linked. Oh, okay. It is. It is. It's dynamically linked in a strange way, but it is dynamically linked. <laughs> a shared object is also uh, dynamically linked, but again, it's dynamically linked in another way. So. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you get, you get some fun, right? And, and different platforms have different ways of dynamic linking their stuff. Most of them use the shared object concept where you have a string representing your function you want to call. But not all of them, like Amiga uses the jump tables, as they're called, from the 68K days. And other platforms use similar techniques. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah this Programming is difficult sometimes, <laughs> especially multi-platform. So if you just stick with Amiga, everything will be fine. <laughs> Couldn't think too much. So yeah, the libraries in Amiga OS, these libraries, like uh, intuition.library, it's a shared library. You load it in, you're sharing it with all the other processes in the system, sharing the code. So each of your processes is running through the code at a different point. It's running through there, executing instructions. Yeah. Now, um, yeah, I said we have hundreds of functions split up into different shared libraries. Each shared library further split up now into interfaces. <laughs> Much more detail about interfaces and libraries can be found at that link <laughs> if you want to know all the ins and outs. Uh, yeah, interfaces were introduced in 4.0 has had a couple purposes. Uh, the major purpose was to allow the mixing of PowerPC and 68K code in the same system, and you could run through the 68K, 68K code and jump to PowerPC code and back again, and the system could figure out what you're trying to pull off. Right? That's the main reason why it was added. It's a way of uh, discriminating. But. Um, Another thing was it, it helps you get rid of uh, namespace pollution, which is another discussion entirely. Uh, <laughs> but it also, may, it also means uh, it's, everything's more complicated, because now you've got this extra layer to worry about, right? <laughs> so there's a lot of controversy. It was, a good idea. was it a good idea? Was it a bad idea? I don't want to get into that. <laughs> it, I'll just, say, one, I'll just say it's different. Not. Yes. I got one quick question, even question? One, not one of your students. <laughs> Hello. Uh, is, uh, are interfaces any slower than jump tables? Are they slower than jump tables? That's a tough, uh, tough I mean, call because a jump table is a 68K concept. Yeah. 
Um, but, <laughs> and, but it, and we're on Power PC now. Yeah. <laughs> now you do have one. You have one extra level of indirection, so you'd have to say yes, it is. Okay. That's, however, that's just the question I was asking. However, <laughs> CPUs aren't that dumb anymore. <laughs> They're, they're going to notice the pattern and they're going to cache things. Okay. So uh, you could say, okay, it's slower the, for the first call. Okay. You could say that. Because I, I tried that, to implement them in just <laughs> raw C code without using any operating system calls and it mm -hmm. seemed to require double indirection, so it yes. was slower. Yes, of course. Yeah. yeah. But again, you have the caching and everything. It okay. doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, it matters if you're doing very tight loops and you're calling a, a function pointer all the time. Yeah. All okay. the time. Which is should be rare because if you have a design like that, the, the design's broken. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you shouldn't be doing indirection if you're if that's your purpose in life is to crunch a, say a finite element model, you shouldn't be using function pointers. No, it's a bad idea, right? <laughs> yeah, that's the one where you want the static linking. You want the static, yeah. You want it as hardcore, as fast as possible, right? You, you want to skip pointers entirely. <laughs> I, I remember uh, having a discussion about this actually with, uh, I think it was Carl Sassenrath uh, a couple of Emmy Wests ago, uh, how Rebel does it. And uh, yeah, he, he uses, uh, he doesn't use pointers direct. It's, it's more of hammering, right? It's more of a jump table style. Uh, very, very, very efficient. He's used arrays with indices. It's like uh, very interesting. Is that with the interpreter? Yeah, in the Rebel Core, yeah, which, which hopefully we'll see soon. <laughs> it's supposed to open source it soon, but uh, so we'll find out exactly what's going on. <laughs> That's an aside, though. Um, <laughs> now back to libraries and interfaces. So, opening, closing. I gave a little example on opening, opening an interface that's named versus opening an interface that's, mm, what is that, open interface, name, open interface, I face, name. oh this is try and this is open, yeah, so this one, this one's for optional interfaces, that's for mandatory interfaces. I just gave some simple code to show you kind of how I do it in my programs, how I handle the uh, interface. I Because it, it, this code is repeated so many times, like opening library, opening interface, I always like to encapsulate it a little bit. And uh, it brings up a point here that uh, I want to point out. Where's my marker? <laughs> I think I'll go to the board. Sorry, camera guy. <laughs> I got a board over here. There's a reason why. OK. Ah, library.
I don't understand what the point of interface is. Uh, like, like I was trying to say, it, it, it was helpful in the 68K mix up. We have mix up the mix in the code. Did you have explicit interfaces with uh, like a letter in the 68K? Well, 68K uses a jump table. Right. And so you know that it's not going to be able to call PPC code directly because you're not using a jump table. So oh, I see your point. You're adding an extra layer. To yes. The can I ask a student question? Yep. Why can't the operating system be smart? So Why can't it be smart? I don't know. I wasn't around back then. <laughs> oh, MarfoS uses a different form of jump table. And it just kind of has a hack to detect whether it's a power PC function or a SDK function. And it will just kind of magically do the right thing. Yeah, I believe it's a trap. Yeah. Okay. So you, you can fake it. So it's trapping constantly. Yeah, but that's that's not necessarily a very good solution. So, oh. fair enough. Yeah. Okay. Which which but, which bad you, idea do you want? Well, <laughs> yeah. I suppose you want to avoid problems. <laughs> if you want to mix this code this, together, this you got to pick something. Yeah. 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 Fair enough. Just curious. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's exactly what 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 it was. I wasn't around when that decision was made, but it would have been an interesting discussion. Wish it was actually. Because everybody's doing the same problem. Yeah. It was interesting. <laughs> Everybody having the same problem because of 68,000? Yeah, because you want to be able to run it transparently. right? So the user doesn't care. Especially Yeah. But this way, the programmer cares too much, perhaps. And then there's one other solution. Yeah. And that is just don't share the binaries between 68K and our PC. Yeah, you can always do the fat binary idea. Uh, uh, that, or other things. Everybody know about the fat binary idea? <laughs> See, so uh, yeah, there's there's more than one solution. Yeah, that doesn't help you. That doesn't necessarily help you if you want to mismatch first party libraries and so forth. Yeah. So makes life interesting. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's <laughs> reason I was just kind of curious. Yeah. No, it's a. Uh, so was I. <laughs> Uh, then I got the close interface. See, I, I pass in an interface pointer, grab the library base, close the interface, close the library. So you got to do an order. You have to do an order. Interface first, library second. <laughs> I'll, I'll show uh, show these in action in, uh, in a later tutorial. Just wanted to point out this is some of the code I like to use. One other quick question. If I know the shared library is 68K shared library, presumably I can just use open the open library call. I don't need to, I don't need to be doing any of this, right? I don't need to Oh if you want to use if you want to use that, you gotta use a... how do you do that again? Is that where the glue file comes in? Yeah, there's a glue something. It's a glue file. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't remember at the moment how, how I do that. I've never called a 68K library. <laughs> okay. Wasn't that where there was a dot .l or dot .main or something like that? Yeah, that's the glue file. Yeah. And it, it allows you to jump between the two, right. uh, the two uh, designs, I guess you'd say, the two architectures. Yeah, yeah. So I don't remember right now. I'll have to look it up again. Okay. Yeah. Need uh, Jorg or Hans Jorg or somebody. <laughs> Explain that one. <laughs> Special syntax. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. So with this interface thing, it, it kind of looks cool. You know, you got the interface and then an arrow and then that. But the compiler underneath will do this, actually. It sticks this, stick this in here every time. <laughs> so that got very tedious. So... Uh, <laughs> They changed the compiler so that it implicitly sticks this interface pointer in the front of every function call that you make. It does that for you. And then I mentioned, notice how they're hidden when you use the modified GNU C++ compiler. So it looks like this, right? Now I purposely print 42, which is actually invalid. Purposely did that. That, that won't compile. <laughs> well, it will It'll give me a nice warning. See, when I try to debug print F42, it'll go, warning, passing argument to of blah, 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 makes pointer from integer without a cast. See, makes perfect sense, right? 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can all see. That's, that's, because, that's because Adam thought it was a perfect number? It's very succinct. <laughs> a lot of people hate the error messages. A lot of people hate them. You're like, yeah. what? <laughs> and then you look here. First of all, argument two. I passed one argument. What? <laughs> You're counting your arguments going, I know how to count to one. Do you, you know how to count to two? Yeah. <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> so, yes, see I put the little note here. It's that hidden I exact argument that it, it hid. It Why hides it from the... the, counter on the it, doesn't, it doesn't fix the error message so that it tells you the truth, right? It's hiding it. That catches a lot of beginners. So I wanted to mention that. <laughs> and then, of course, the makes pointer from integer without a cast. Does that make sense now, what that error means? No? I'm, I'm kind of trying to gauge how type savvy you are. <laughs> makes pointer from integer. See, I gave it a 42. 42 goes into i exec, which is a pointer. See? <laughs> Why is 42 going into I exec? Because I gave it an error on purpose. <laughs> I'm trying to trying to force it to, to spit, it, spit out this error message. Now I could cast it. I could say 42, you're I exec. Then you get a visit from the guru. <laughs> so oh, I, know how I know a lot of programmers love to typecast it. If you get a warning, oh I'll just typecast it. Now you stop and think for a minute. <laughs> it's probably trying to save you. <laughs> it's kind of why I'm trying to drive home the, home the point there. <laughs> it's trying to help you. Let it help you. <laughs> and what you can do with these error messages is you can take this, take the quotes, put it up in Google, quote, quote, hit search, and you'll see a hundred other people with exactly the same question as you have. What does this mean? <laughs> And uh, hopefully, uh, I don't know, maybe 50% of the time is pretty good an answer. <coughs> How often do you, have you tried it yet, Paul, taking the error messages and cut and pasting? Yeah, you gotta remove the line. Oh, it does do a cast. <laughs> you do a cast and get the guru, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is that why this thing practices so well? Yeah, yeah, see, I, I just, that's what I do. Cause you know, I didn't understand what that meant the first time I saw it either. I just looked it up. <laughs> then after a while, you get the hang of it. But it's asking you for a cast. Yeah, it's, it's saying, well, why are you warning me? Just cast it. That's the other attitude. <laughs> Strongly typed language is trying to help you. See, if, if you were in a Python scenario, it would just run. and It would, it would do something insane. You don't know. <laughs> Actually, it would probably print 42, but... Uh, that's not the point. Now, if I thought it was 1042, it'll do the conversion. It'll do the conversion because it'll say, well, it looks like a number. I'll treat it like a number. <laughs> oh, okay. That's the end of that. No, oh, that was easy. Yeah, I kind of glossed over the uh, interface stuff a bit. I know. Um, I think I'll make another small point about the interfaces. Uh, Interfaces should not be shared between contexts. So if you have an interface pointer, you do not share it between your processes. You do not share it. You, can't, you do share library-based pointers, you do not share interface pointers. All right. Does it mean, mean much to you yet? <laughs> so if I had a child process and I wanted to use I intuition, I have to go and get it again in the child process get the interface. This is, this is important for later. Not what, important now. What does L auto do with it? It's point, yeah. <laughs> point is important for later. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's, see, that's why I don't like L auto. <laughs> so now it's breaking down. It's uh -huh. like, well, which one did I just get? <laughs> do I have to close it? What, what do I do? <laughs> it gets complicated. I, that's why I like the explicit. But uh, so I should say I pointed out, uh, most people won't care yet, but uh, if you start using multiple processes, you will. You will care. <laughs> and that's why I did task and processes next. Jeez, that 
can't believe it, I planned this. <laughs> <laughs> and the next question is, did you plan for an end of day? So Sorry? You, you plan for an end of day? Uh, for what? End of day. End, what, end what, of what, day? Yeah, what about dinner? Oh, well, we're on our own for end of day. For dinner. We don't get dinner in here. But? We just have to stop. Right. Yes. When? Well, not now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I got 20 minutes. <laughs> I was thinking five. So. Oh, that's <laughs> funny. <laughs> yeah, not now. Yeah, see, I don't have much to go. Don't worry, don't worry. It's almost done. Um, just wanted to get this kind of out of the way, especially for the uh, for the programmer types, that are into it, LD types. <laughs> I, I have a nice. Uh, this is actually called a UML diagram, but a class diagram. Um, this is showing that a process inherits from a task. So a process is a type of task. <laughs> so in Amiga's, because of that DOS shoe, you know, ramming DOS into there late, they kind of had to have a place to put all their variables for all their processes. So they invented this thing called a process and they stuck all their variables in there. Um, versus a task, which is very, very low level, doesn't have input output, and doesn't have many services at all. Now a task is very, very lightweight, very lightweight, and hardly has any extra baggage with it. Hardly uses any RAM. But generally, you don't use them in Amigo OS. In fact, it's discouraged. Don't use a task unless you really, really have to. Yeah. I mean, we're not even using tasks on the uh, simplest process or simplest tasks anymore. Uh, can't use the word task. Simplest uh, chore. <laughs> uh, you'll see, uh, for example, if I run Ranger. Where's my Ranger? And you need him. There he is. That's all the tasks in the system. Doesn't have much. <laughs> So, see, that, that's all that's running, you think. Oh, that's pretty boring. <laughs> see, we don't hardly use um, tasks at all anymore. And they're low level things, very low level. Very low level indeed. I'd even make some of these processes now. Just, just because it's so much easier to debug a process. Now, there's your list of processes. There's a lot of things going on. <laughs> A lot of things. So you can see even the, even the OS programmers are preferring processes over tasks. And on a power PC, and with uh, many megabytes of RAM now, you don't really care so much about uh, saving overhead. On OS 3, yeah. it saved a total of about 128 bytes. There you go, 128 bytes, which mattered back then. Yeah. Yeah, see? So, <laughs> that's certain. They were both scheduled the same way. There's no difference there. They're both flipped, flipped about the same way. They both look identical in many ways. But exec, uh, tasks are done by exec and processes, or exec library. Processes are handled by DOS library when you're creating them. So um, a lot of times you'll encounter code which, uh, which will take a process and typecast it to a task because it's allowed. A process is a task. It is. <laughs> That's what the arrow means, is a. <laughs> so um, don't be alarmed. That's good. That's a normal thing. <laughs> now the other way, very bad. Crash. Guru coming. <laughs> a task is not a process. <laughs> then I got a little bit, some notes here. And, uh, All processes. No. That's right. You got it. <laughs> all processes are tasks, but not all tasks are processes. <laughs> well, none of them are. Yeah. <laughs> wow, we're already covering object-oriented programming. We're only in the second lesson. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you bet. <laughs> now, um, I also got a little bit about synchronization primitives, because when you have two entities running in parallel, 
and you want to share data, you're going to run into problems. <laughs> so, you know, because one process wants some data while the other one wants it at the same time, bad things happen. So there's a few, few services that are available in the OS to help you out there. Um, you got signals, which are just simple little ones and zeros that go on and off. It's basically a, kind of like Morse code for uh, signal light on ships. <laughs> signals. <laughs> Message ports, which are fancier. Message ports, uh, you have a port on this side, port on that side, two different processes. You pass a message between the two. You say, I want this, this guy goes, here you go. You're passing it back and forth. The OS is handling all the synchronization for you. Semaphores, which are a little, little uh, lower level, which basically says, well, if I grab the semaphore, then you can't have it, and then I can fill it with whatever it is. Then I let go of the semaphore, then you can have it fill it with whatever it is, this resource. <laughs> History has shown people aren't very good at semaphores programming. Humans aren't very good at it. They try hard, but they're not good at it. <laughs> I, I've seen great success with message passing uh, operating systems. Um, they're, they're a lot more better understood by us. <laughs> Mutexes, there's a, the next one. That, that's kind of like a type of semaphore in a way. It's, it's a very low level, raw semaphore. <laughs> It only has exclusive access to something, and it's extremely fast. Uh, that's why it was added. It's because uh, semaphores were used so much in the OS that uh, they were looking for ways to speed it up. One way is to redesign it. Another way is just to make the semaphores a little quicker. So <laughs> replace them with the mutex. Wham! Everything's faster. So <laughs> that was one of the design decisions made. And they are much quicker. Oh, I have a little note about shared memory, but uh, you know, how much time do we have? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you can mark memory shared, so you can share them between two processes, or you can mark it private, which means only I am using this memory, only this one process. You don't want to mix those up. It's bad, <laughs> especially when the kernel changes some more. You're not gonna like the results if you mix them up. <laughs> now there are, there are a few other uh, ways to share resources between things, but uh, I didn't get into the details here. There's uh, named memory, uh, named objects, another thing. I didn't want to make it even worse. <laughs> Then I have a little blurb about shared objects. Oh, oh yes, it's from they're from the Unix world, like I mentioned right there. <laughs> Unix is a good thing; it makes the internet run. Uh, <laughs> uh, the main, main reason that was shared objects were added is to make it simpler to port complex applications. That's really the purpose. Uh, if you want to really get down to it. They were added to the OS so you could port Firefox. <laughs> There's a reason, right? <laughs> and, and you'll notice uh, it's running. <laughs> Timberwolf actually compiles it. Now you could argue it's not that stable, but that's another argument. So shared objects, uh, Amiga Python uses shared objects right now. That, uh, that saved a lot of hours, I'll tell you that. I mean, you can. You can take any, any shared library from uh, the Unix world, any shared object, you can convert it into a proper Amiga shared library. It's possible. It's not fun, but it's possible. <laughs> I've done it myself, so I, I know what it's, what it's like. And uh, the, the, two, the two are not compatible. They're not compatible. They're two different ways of doing something. So, when they added shared objects, it really helped helped me uh, port application very very fast. <laughs> For example, I got uh, back to Rebel again. I got Rebel going, and like uh, I got Carl Sassenrath. He used a shared object to compile Rebel. It took ten minutes. <laughs> or he could have spent a week or two trying to make it work as a shared library in Amiga, right? 
now, now this guy is very busy. <laughs> you think he's going to wait? <laughs> so, <laughs> and the beautiful thing is, you can make a shared library later. You can make a, make a shared library later. This is just to get it going, right? So, it, it went. And there's a little article that Hans Jörg wrote about the right tool for the job. You know, don't blindly use these things. <laughs> just because it's there, you want to use the right tool for the job, right? If you're making Amiga-specific stuff, you want to use shared libraries as much as you can. But how much time do you have? So <laughs> you got to weigh pluses and minuses. I'm, I've used both now. I, uh, I prefer the shared libraries. The shared objects have their charm. <laughs> but uh, after, after being an admin on Unix and fighting shared library hell, <laughs> I don't like it so much either. It's, it's remember DLL hell from Windows, shared life object hell that can pop up too. Yeah, no, no platforms immune, though we like to pick on Windows. <laughs> Amiga shared libraries you can get in hell there too. Can, uh, a good example would be movie classes. How much fun are those when they're incompatible? They're shared libraries. <laughs> So, there you go, right? Oh, I remember that you could actually use interfaces to help you get out of that situation. Yep. Can you use interfaces to get out sure. of it? So let's say I have you can version it much stronger. That's my point, yeah. Much stronger. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, we've had, we have one OS component with a version 2 interface now. Sweet. Didn't break any of the old stuff. Yeah. We got a brand new interface. So it has been used once already. Only once, but once. <laughs> it seems to me to be very useful. Yeah, yeah. And then you version the interface, right? And now any new code just uses version 2. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they're both coexisting. Yeah. And the user just sees one library sitting there. So they're happy. The user's happy. That's good. <laughs> so there you go. Any questions? The user won't see the library unless he's called the add library. Yeah. yeah. Don't care. <laughs> That's something that happened with NUI where you had, every time you started another thing, you had to go find something on the net to run. Oh, the well, that's another problem. <laughs> Finding the shared libraries, yeah. There's solutions to that too, which uh, we're working on. <laughs> Dependency management, yeah. Getting there. <laughs> Any other questions, shared objects or private shared memory? I'm just glossing over the top here. Well, I'm, not, I'm not giving you detail, there's a lot more. Yeah, actually, I, I am kind of curious as to the, the concepts on different types of memory spaces when you declare your application and you just do a prime versus share. The, verse, the memory spaces? Yeah, I mean, I, yep. I assume you want us every, everything to be private unless there's an actual reason. Mm -hmm. There's sure. a, I actually, I actually wrote a lot of information about that now in the exact section. Okay. Yeah, and uh, it's on the wiki. If you look in kernel, exec memory, there's a lot of information there now. I've uh, what I did was I consolidated all of the different pieces that were scattered around and tried to put them just on the wiki in one spot and get rid of all the duplicate information. That's what I tried to do. So uh, it took a lot of hours actually. Does the does the does the US have the concept of memory keys? Memory keys? Yeah. I'm not it's even familiar with memory keys. Are you talking the uh, so Linux memory keys? Not exactly. They're they're SH key. They're, it comes from it, uh, it comes from the idea of the world back in the day. But a lot of other platforms have been put through software. The idea being, in addition to having the concept of memory protection, you actually protect them over one other level to the point where no no process, even if it is in the uh, address space, can touch this particular region without first requesting a key and doing a tag comparison. The idea is it helps you with security. Oh my. No, no. So I, I think the answer to my question is no. No, no. Okay. That's interesting though. Yeah. It is. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It is. It is. Memory keying. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. I've seen something kind of like that, but it was more of a handle. Int. Uh, you, you, kind of, you grab an int and you get a yeah, pointer. You take the int and you resolve to a pointer and then you can access the memory. Yeah, but that kind of idea. I think you want to do some, you want to have a supporting hardware too because 
Otherwise, the number of repairs that you're doing all the time is painful plus. Yeah. If yeah. it's very finely grained, now you've got, you're constantly fetching from memory and you're filling up your caches with, with the keys. I don't think that's actually on the, on the uh, radar from EgoS. The, the only kind of protection I've seen that uh, is on the radar is that you can mark an interface as protected, meaning that you can't redirect the pointers. <laughs> okay. Uh, you'll know in Amiga you can you can redirect pointers. You can do a set function. Now there's a set method as well, which helps you with interfaces, and you can change what that function does for every other process in the system at any time. It's a scary thought if you're in security. Yes. <laughs> but it's 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 very freeing if you're not into security. <laughs> Because imagine the amount of hacking you can do. It's absolutely wonderful. Of course, it goes completely against security. <laughs> so you publish the source code to Ranger? <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I'm going to avoid that one. <laughs> Yes. You're reading the wiki. I am. Excellent. <laughs> I, Somebody has internet. I, I would appreciate feedback when you're done, actually. Because <laughs> we've been trying to fix that up so many times. We've been editing it like mad. It's, it, it's tr trying, to, trying to get it to distilled format because in Amigo S 4.x, everyone is confused about this memory type stuff. And in the legacy Amiga, oh, it's ten times worse. The strange stuff like... Uh, you got these flags largest in there, you got this delayed, may or may not do anything. You got and you also 24 to different something. Physical memory yeah. Spaces. They were running out of bits. <laughs> 32 bits. They're starting to run out of bits. They're adding so many features to the a lock mem call. That's a bad sign when you run out of flags like that. Yeah. So uh, uh, Thomas Greeden has been redesigning that and trying to simplify it down to three types. Didn't even want three types, but you know you have to go somewhere, and uh, and a couple other things for drivers. Like you can lock memory, you can uh, uh, get contiguous memory. You know if you're doing drivers. Presumably there would never be a reason. Assuming I'm not doing hardware banging or anything with IF or ever, mm -hmm. to lock memory. That's right. Normally you don't even think about that, but at least it's there. It used to be quite an interesting. Uh, well, there are certain uh, patterns forming in the old old code. Like you, everything would be public, they call it. And uh, you'd have to align your memory yourself and stuff like that. <coughs> you have to align it manually, you yeah. know. If you're doing drivers. Uh, chunk that was yeah. aligned to a 64 byte boundary. Yeah. And it was that fun. would allocate 128 bytes. <laughs> and that find where the boundary was and then just lose that pointer. So you'd have to do it all manually. Yeah. So we got rid of all that, and it's just one tag where we used to say, I want to align it on a 32-bit, and it's done. Yeah, that's what you're yeah, 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 the operating system takes care of it now. No more fiddly. Yeah. <laughs> it makes driver writing a little bit more pleasant, I'll tell you. <laughs> any more uh, questions on any of this stuff? Again, very high-level hand-waving, but... Did you get into the limitations of the task versus process? The limitations of, of a task versus process? I mean, aren't there a lot of limitations about the things that tasks can do? Well, yeah, tasks can't do much of anything, but yeah. a process can do anything. Right. Yeah, like a task has no access to DOS. Or so there's no file I.O., there's no character I.O. You can't do intuition also, can't pass messages. No intuition, no graphics, no... Uh, doesn't do much of anything, right? It's, it's just basically a small workhorse. It's just doing one little thing. I thought that's it could pass messages, and that's about it. It could pass messages, of course, okay. yeah. So it's good So it's good for responding when you're waiting for an interrupt or something? Yes. Yes. If you're waiting for an interrupt, that's that's a good good uh, element to use. Yeah. Yeah. The reason I use processes now is because they're uh, they're feature rich, and, and you can uh, debug things a little nicer because it's got extra features. Like, uh, it's got a proper name. It's got 
it's got a way to spawn child processes and track them. It's got a process ID. Tests don't have PIDs. Well, that's a thing that's fixed up for. It doesn't sound like much unless you're really it's into OS coding. You, it's, yeah. it's a lot. <laughs> you need a PID. <laughs> so how does, how does exactly track the tests? It's how just a linked list. Te really technically right? under the covers, it's a linked list. And it doesn't know what it's running. It just goes. So, so literally, if you had a tiny little corruption in that data structure. A tiny corruption, it's over. Wow. Yeah. Very, very tight. Very tight. I take it tasks date back from a long time ago. Tasks? That was 1.0. 1.0. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> very, very long time ago. Yeah. yeah. I believe it was Carl Sassenrath that invented the month. I could ask at some point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know this, this seems a little silly these days. Usually in an OS, you only have one type. Well, I guess in a world when you're, you're measuring the memory availability in lower kilobytes, yeah, I guess you could make an argument for it. I always thought it was what? Right? <laughs> Most of your OS doesn't actually do all the time. Yeah, yeah. That. There you go. Any more questions there? So Bill, I don't know what we're going to do next, but uh, I think we're hungry.